Good. Good evening, animators, potential animators, student personnel, and other stakeholders. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar titled The Madrid Protocol, Protecting Your Am Animated Projects Globally, organized by JAMPRO and JIPO. I am Shevar Harris, Senior Sales and Promotions Officer at JAMPRO, your moderator for this evening's session. Today, we'll be dealing with the Madrid Protocol. What is it really? Why is it relevant to you, players in the animation industry? How can you harness the benefits of this protocol? So in short, this is about trademarking and copywriting, which is about protecting the ownership of the work of your hands and your minds. So why is this important? According to the IMF, cross-border flows of royalties, licenses and fees increased from 3.5 billion US dollars in 1970 to approximately 700 billion in 2015. RLF receipts and payments in the world economy grew at a relatively quick rate, 10% per annum average. Still today, high income countries make up for the bulk, close to 99% of RLF receipts, almost unchanged from 10 to 15 years earlier. And those countries, those high income countries make up 84% of royalty payments. Just, to, just some perspective on what that means. In that year, 2015, the United States received 124, 124, 665 billion US dollars in RLF receipts and made 39 billion in payments. Ireland, interestingly enough, paid out 75 billion US dollars in RLF, which is royalties, licenses, and fees. In 2019, merchandise sales in this product category, which is uh, uh, merchandise sales from animation, I should, I should point out, reached 128.4 billion US dollars in sales. This was an increase of approximately $5.7 billion or 4.4% over the previous year. The category accounted for 43.8% of all global retail sales of merchandise, of licensed merchandise. This evening, Dr. Marcus Goff, Deputy Director and Legal Counsel of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, or JIPO, will inform us about in more detail about the protocol and how it works. He will then be followed by Tristan Alene, Senior Sales and Promotions Officer of the Film Commission of JAMPRO, who will let us know how we can protect our animation projects. Although we don't have a lot of animated productions at this time, we need to know and equip ourselves to fully benefit from the work that will come from our businesses. Before we dive in, some housekeeping. One, all microphones will be muted for the, direct, for the duration of the seminar, sorry, the webinar. Please direct all of your questions in the question and answer um, box, which you'll see in your, um, in, on your screen. We will address the questions. Uh, um, we will address questions asked at the end of the webinar. At the end of both presentations, then we'll take your questions and we'll address them. And finally, the webinar will be recorded. Without further ado, let us get to our first presentation by Dr. Goff. By Dr. Marcus Goff. Dr. Goff. All right. Thank you very much, um, Shavar. And thanks to my fellow, pen, uh, my fellow panelists, and thanks to Jampro for um, organizing this important webinar. Um, so I'm just gonna go right into it. Um, I'm going to be sharing briefly on the Madrid Protocol and its intended impact for us here in Jamaica. All right, so let me just uh, do the slideshow. And that should be okay. Let me see. Right. Right. Um, so what I intend to do is just to introduce the main elements of the Madrid Protocol um, and to show how it works and the potential I'd say, benefits for MSMEs, including our animators in the local industry. All right, so first a bit about JIPO, right? So uh, 
Jaipo is the government agency responsible for administering the IP laws in Jamaica. I'll just say IP for short. Right? We are an agency in the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. We are responsible for IP registration. Um, and of course, I'll go into more detail with what that is or entails. That includes registration of trademarks, designs, patents, GIs, which are geographical indications, and copyright. Uh, so we are the national repository for such IP registrations in Jamaica. We do a lot of public education about IP rights, helping people to understand the importance of IP rights. We also raise a lot with interest groups in different areas concerning science, technology, music, arts, etc. We advise um, the government as it relates to IP policy and IP laws. And so we are the um, focal point for IP in the country. All right, let me see. Slide, slide doesn't seem to be moving with me. No. Seem to be stuck. All right, so I might need to either convert to the other format or maybe to get some assistance from our jumper host to click. Yeah. I don't know, let me try. All right, thank you. So I was just going on to slide three. Thank you. Right, so what is IP, right? That's a very important question for us to understand as we begin to talk about trademarks and the Madrid Protocol. So IP um, are legal rights which result from intellectual activity, whether in the scientific, industrial, artistic, literary, musical, or dramatic fields. Uh, so as we like to say, anything that the, the mind can conceive, there is some legal tool uh, to protect it in terms of ensuring that it is being used only with your, the creator's consent, right? Next slide, please. Uh, IP rights then give the owner of the IP, the right to prevent unauthorized copying, sale, offering for sale, use or passing up of their property, right? Uh, any use requires, as I said, the author's consent. The IP rights also give the, the IP owners the right in law to be compensated for infringement, which again means any unauthorized use of your property by others. Next slide, please. So the IP owners are given certain rights in law and certain remedies, remedies being legal tools to be able to enforce your ownership of your property. And they have the exclusive rights also in law to be able to use and control uh, the use and distribution, copying, display, et cetera, of their IP rights. And the use of the IP in Jamaica without the proprietor's consent constitutes an infringement of such rights. So this is what we call the family of IP rights, right? Um, so we have as subsets industrial property on the left in the middle that can be further subdivided into designs, patents, trademarks, and geographical indications. Each of those being a separate IP right, which they have things in common, but also have differences which are important as well. In the middle, we have, sorry, sorry, just to go to that slide again. In the middle, we have copyright and related rights. And that one now covers the arts, culture, music, drama, film, song recordings, photographs, etc. Then we have traditional knowledge, which is the most recent uh, IP subset, which covers the protection of traditional music, art forms, culture, etc. Thank you. So what are trademarks? Trademarks are one of the key um, IP rights right, that persons have, or IP, forms of property that people have. Trademarks are distinctive signs or symbols, including names, logos, shapes, colors, odors, and sounds, which are capable of distinguishing one producer's products and services from the other in the marketplace, right? So it is what your business uh, uses as a symbol or a sign, something that is identifiable by the public to be able to distinguish what you're offering from your competitor. 
having your trademark registered makes it easier to prove your ownership of same gives you the legal rights of registration which the law provides and also prevents your competitors from copying it or at least it gives you certain um as i say remedies or tools to be able to respond to unauthorized copying of your ip trademarks must be distinctive for the products or services involved um, so it can't be too close or too similar to somebody else's own for the same type of product or service. It must be different so as to be able to have the consumer uh, to differentiate from yours uh, than the others in the marketplace. It's a central part of your brand identity, an important part of what you need to be able to uh, successfully market your products and services in the marketplace. Next slide, please. So here we see some examples of some animation industry trademarks, right? Um, <clears throat> so persons who are here might be familiar with some of these having worked in the industry, right? We see John Jamaica Animation Nation Network, John. Um, we see Listen Me Caribbean, uh, King's Tune is there, Liga the Maroons being one of the Listen Me um, products. Yadai is also relatively new, youth employment in the digital and the animation industries project. And we have there also um, a poster for an event, animation goldmine. So these again are trademarks used to show what is the organization that is producing this event or producing this animation series, etc. So very vital also, of course, for the, the animation industry. Next slide, please. So trademark registration. Trademarks do not have to be registered, but they are certainly benefits to being registered. Um, so there are three routes that you can take to registration. Uh, well, depending on where you want to have your trademark protected, right? Because as trademarks go, they're generally governed by the law of the country where the trademark is filed and registered, right? So you have the national route, which is the primary route, where people can file their application for registration with the trademark office of the country that you are located in or you want protection in. So for example, you would file in Jamaica, you have protection for Jamaica only. If you want to file it in the USA similarly, you would file it in the USA separately. Maybe you wanted to file it in Jamaica, USA, and let's say China, and you would have to file it in those three countries separately. So you do have the regional route for certain regions, right? Not, not all regions, where you may be able to file a trademark application in several uh, member states of that region. So we have, for example, a repo, which is the, the, the African Regional IP Organization, and filed in several African countries through that route. You have Benelux, which is for Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg uh, in Europe. They are combined to have one um process for their member states you have the EUIPO, of course the EUIP office and OWAPI is for the French African countries so those are, those are also regional registration routes that are possible but of course uh, we don't have um any such in the Caribbean and then you have the international route which is what we're talking about here which is going to have people be able to file through the Madrid protocol in countries of your choice next slide please so what is the Madrid Protocol? The Madrid Protocol allows trademark registration in multiple countries via one application in your home country, right? It therefore facilitates easier global reach of your brand to the world. It's an easier procedure to file applications instead of having to go to each country separately. And for that reason, it works so to be cheaper than having to go to each country separately. And so it is, an easier route to get your trademarks protected in the foreign jurisdictions of your choice. Next slide, please. What is the Madrid system? So the system really facilitates the centralized filing and management of trademarks by the applicants. Um, they're managed, um, the system is managed by WIPO, the World IP Organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. What they provide is a one-stop shop for trademark holders to obtain and to maintain their trademark protection in several export markets, right? So, so you can file one application in one language and pay one set of fees for protection in multiple markets. So I should say here is one set of fees. So it's, not, it's not a one fee, right? And 
often we hear people um, saying it's a one fee that gives you protection in all countries of the world. It's not, it's not, it's not like that. It's one set of fees, but the fees are calculated based on the number of countries that you want to register in. And each country will have um, their fees to be paid as well. And so, you know, you have to choose which countries you want and then pay accordingly, right? It's not a one fee for the globe, as it were. But it still is cost effective, as I said, because you don't have to go to each country yourself or you have to get a lawyer in each country yourself, which is oftentimes a requirement. And so it permits for filing uh, through WIPO with other member states and therefore works out to be easier for you as the applicant to do so. Next slide, please. So it's a closed system, meaning that it's not open to everybody to file. You must have some connection with a contracting party to be able to use the protocol, right? So you must have some connection either through having a real and effective industrial or commercial establishment in the country or have the domicile or nationality of the country, right? To be able to, to, to file through that country. And so for Jamaica then, for example, uh, you'd have to, you know, if you wanna file through Jamaica, once we, once we sign on to the treaty, you would have to then either as I say, be a Jamaican national, uh, be domiciled in Jamaica, or have a real and effective industrial or commercial establishment in Jamaica to be able to use JIPO for your local IP office, right? So you must have a basic mark to be able to file with WIPO. How does the system work? So there are three major stages that we can look at here. The first stage is to have the basic application or registration, the basic mark. You have to have a trademark is either filed for, applied for, um, or it's been granted here in Jamaica through JIPO. That's the first thing you have to have, right? Stage one. Then in stage two, you have to have that application now that you have filed for international registration. It will be um, uh, examined <clears throat> um, to see if it can be registered in the, the, the countries of your choice. So again, you, you have the form, you have to choose whether you want EU IPO, you want um, Argentina and Trinidad and Tobago, you may want to go to Africa and Costa Rica. You can choose which countries you want and pay accordingly um, to get that uh, done. And stage three, then you have the scope of protection whereby each contracting party who examines the application would have to either choose to refuse it in their country or to grant it in their country. Um, and that is then the final stage where you get to know whether or not you have it protected in that country of your choice. Next slide, please. So in a bit more detail, stage one, um, right? Yeah, must have the basic mark. Um, once they filed in Jamaica at JIPO, if you're coming through JIPO, and then you file your application to WIPO again through JIPO. We will certify and forward it to WIPO to start the process for you. Next slide. For stage two, WIPO conducts a formalities examination to make sure that you have complied with all the formalities that WIPO has um, that they require. Once approved, the mark is recorded in the international register held by WIPO, right? That is, of course, after it's been um examined what would say the cert certificate of registration to notify you it's been registered and then it will be examined by the ip offices in stage three this is where now as i said before next slide please they will either choose to accept or to refuse registration within a 12 or 18 months period um, if it's granted then you will have the, the grant of protection which will be valid for 10 years from the date of filing. If it's refused, then you will have the option to maybe appeal in that country if you want, or to still go forward with those that were not refused. Okay. Next slide, please. So the key features in summary then, you have to have a basic mark, right? Based or coming through Jamaica, through JIPO. Uh, you will have to file one application through JIPO again, to pinpoint which countries you want to register your trademark in. The fixed time limit for refusal by these countries you choose. Uh, some choose 12 or some choose 18 months as the, the limit. WIPO 
examines only for formalities and then each contracting party will do the, 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 um, the examination of the trademark to ensure it complies with national law. Um, then thereafter, you can expand to go to new markets. You can tailor your list of goods and services for different markets. So maybe you're producing a set of products that you want for the USA market, but you have a different set of products that you want for the European market. You can tailor your, your trademark registration for different countries by virtue of what you foresee you will need to use or to market in those different countries. WIPO has one centralized portfolio to manage your trademarks, and so it's easier for you to, to do so. Um, what it does do, however, is that the trademark internationally depends on your basic trademark being maintained. So if your basic trademark in the first five years uh, is challenged um, or is canceled, et cetera, then your inter international registration will also be canceled. It's also to bear in mind as well when you think of how this thing works. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so the fees are payable to WIPO in Swiss francs. The basic fee um, includes three classes of goods or services uh, that will cost you 653 Swiss francs for black and white trademark or 993 Swiss francs for a color trademark. And for contracting parties, they may charge a standard fee or a individual fee that can be up to 100 Swiss francs per class. Right. Um, what you do say, what I said, is no local attorney fees um, and LDCs, um, which we're not, benefit from 90% of the fee in terms of a reduction of fee. So you do have some savings, but of course, it also does require planning and some cost expenditure by you. Next slide, please. So how do you get that basic mark in Jamaica. Of course, you come to Jaipo to do so. Um, so as I said before, trademarks don't have to be registered in Jamaica by law, right? But trademark registration does give you certain protection by law, which is more than you get if you don't register. Um, so you choose to register here at Jaipo, you get a trademark registration that is valid for 10 years. It can be renewed every 10 years thereafter. And the Trademarks Act speaks to how the police can help you to enforce your trademarks. Also, through the courts, you have an easier means to enforce once you choose to register. Next slide, please. The process at Jaipo is quite simple. Um, there's a form TM1, which is on the website. It's going to ask you for your name and your address, what goods or services you want to have the trademark registered in, a copy of the trademark, it will be examined by Jaipo, published in the trademark journal. Um, there will be a period of time thereafter where projects can make observations if they think it should not be registered. Projects can also file what is called an opposition to actually legally challenge your trademark being registered if they have some legal ground to do so. But if there's no opposition after two months from publication, if you go through to registration, that would then be given a nice certificate, signed and sealed, verifying your ownership of that trademark. Next slide, please. Uh, the fees are quite affordable, especially when you think of what are the fees overseas. Um, so to file the application, it's going to cost you $7,800 uh, for one class and two, two for every class over one. Right? And then the final payment after the mark has been examined and is been accepted will be two, two for seven, eight, ten thousand dollars final fee, normally payable uh, about five months after the first fee is paid. So again, very reasonable, very affordable, lasts for all of 10 years. Um, and that is then legal proof that you own that trademark. Um, so in conclusion then, um, it's fundamentally important for MSMEs to protect their IP rights in all the markets that they intend to have their goods and services offered for sale, right? You plan to go overseas, the budget protocol offers you the opportunity to do so through one process done through us here at JIPO. For Jamaicans in Jamaica, you have to have a trademark application or registration filed in, in JIPO first as the basic mark. Um, and then from there, you can file your trademark overseas through the Madrid protocol. So with, uh, with us at JIPO first, we'd be glad to help you through the process of the forms being filled out, the fees, et cetera, 
Um, and of course, you can always visit us on our website. Next slide, please. Um, or call us if you'd like to help along through the process. That's it. All right. So thanks very much. I'd be glad to have so, so any questions um, as they arise. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Goff. Um, quite an informative presentation. We have quite a few questions. Um, however, we will be taking the questions at the end of the second presentation, which will be done by Mr. Tristan Alain. Um, for the questions that we see in the chat, we're going to be addressing those afterward as well. So um, at this time, without any further ado, um, Mr. Tristan Alain um, will be presenting to us on the matter of how can you as animators um, protect your projects. Um, Mr. Alain. Thanks, Shavar. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marcus, for that very thorough um, explanation of the Madrid Protocol. Um, so my name is Tristan Elaine. I'm the Senior Sales and Promotions Officer in the Film Commission slash Film Animation and Music Department at JamPro. And um, as Shavar said earlier, there's a massive amount of value being generated uh, from animation prod products. Um, that is being bought and sold through licensing and merchandising. And one of the mechanisms used um, to, to buy and sell these rights is the Madrid Protocol. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that applies to animators. But before I start, I just want to address one question um, about the recording and the presentations. They will be available afterwards. Um, and I think we could maybe we could respond to some of the, the questions while I present. So let me go ahead and share my screen. One moment. Okay, I assume you're seeing. Um, so at the Film Commission slash the Film Animation Music Department at JamPro, um, what we do is we create, facilitate, and advance um, business opportunities for the film animation music um, sectors. Um, as you can see, our purpose is to build global relationships. We want to be a world-class business en enabler and promotions agency. Um, and we drive economic development through growth in investment and export within these sectors. So our focus is investment and export. Um, and as I said before, there is an incredible amount of value coming out of the animation industries and it continues to grow. Um, and the major protocol is one of those ways um, that we see that we could perhaps start to take advantage of, of some of that growth. Um, so how do we um, advance business opportunities? Um, we promote export and investment. Um, we um, develop and implement sector development initiatives, such as the Business of Sustainability for Studios program, which I believe some of the animators online would have been a part of, um, and also programs specific to film, such as the Film Lab program and the Propeller program, which we partner with JAFTA on and partner with the British Council on. Um, we promote Jamaica as a film business location. Um, back when we could travel, we would go to international film festivals and market um, with, with a catalog of content uh, from Jamaica um, that we're trying to find financiers for, find partners for, and find co-producers for. That's one of our roles. Um, now we do that mostly digitally thanks to COVID, um, but it's actually been able to open a few doors for us. Um, and we think it's been, it's important now to start to see our animation industry take advantage of the opportunities um, to, to market and sell uh, their animated products internationally. Um, and of course we, we promote the database of locations here for filming. Um, we provide film production advisory and facilitation support. So you register your film through, through the Film Commission. We support on, um, with liaising with government agencies, the private sector production companies providing permits 
et cetera, um, supporting the provision of permits, um, and then we facilitate standard and specialized permits, which again, within this COVID period that we're in now, um, it could mean uh, supporting with letters for exceptions for filming, for example, during the curfew, if absolutely necessary. That's one of the, the, the services that we offer. So we're here to help you make it easier to um, film and create content and produce and sell content um, during this period. And we also provide policy and advocacy support at John Trust. So um, we advocate for incentives and we guide investors through the, um, the incentive framework in Jamaica. Um, we develop policies um, and we support the development of policies um, that, that help to create an enabling business environment for the film animation and music department, for the film animation and music sectors. Um, and we also uh, do research. And one of those research tools Jampro just released is a baseline study in the animation for the animation industry. I know a number of you would have received that. I urge you to complete it. This information is very important to us because it, um, it helps to provide us with the basis for um, advocating for those incentives, lobbying on behalf of the animation industry, which we know is incredibly valuable um, and, and helping the broader government to understand what the value truly is of the animation industries um, and quantifying that. Um, and of course, some of those incentives are the productive input relief incentive, which if you're an animator, you should be aware of. It provides cost subs due to relief on equipment coming into the country for productive use. Um, so that's film use and that's animation use. Um, we encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, if you if you are purchasing equipment that could fall within this list um, and we'll support you on how best to take advantage of this of this incentive that's available to you. And of course, one of the um, the agreements that we advocate for is the um, Madrid protocol, which we think will be very important um, to our animators. So, as Marcus had explained, the Madrid Protocol is an inter international treaty um, that is that simplifies the international trade registration process. Um, Jamaica is is on the path to um, being a part of this treaty um, and joining the 90 countries that you'll see to the right here. Um, and what that means is, again, as Marcus said, it's a simplified application process. You would apply through your local office, which is JIPO in this case. Um, it's in one language. Uh, that makes it much easier. You wouldn't need to go and hire support in the, in the case of applying your trademark to an individual, um, individual territory or, or a regional territory. Um, and, it's, and it's cost effective. Um, because you're only applying through one office rather than applying through all of them individually based on where it is that you need to um, to get that trademark protection. And this is important because trademark intellectual property, um, the trademark category of that is territorial. So having trademark protection in Jamaica doesn't guarantee you trademark protection in Europe. Uh, for that reason, you would need to be able to have an international mechanism to apply to multiple countries at one time, or you would have to apply individually. So um, this is a massively useful tool, and I hope that you um, you will be taking utilizing it um, as it becomes necessary for you and as you grow your business. But there are some disadvantages um, to the Madrid Protocol. Uh, it's a registration process. It doesn't guarantee approval. And what that means is that you can be applying to multiple territories, but a territory may, um, they have their individual rules. So they may um, deny your application. That's just to make it clear that this registration is not automatic approval. Um, and also your application is based um, on your JIPO application, your local filing. Um, what that means is if something were to happen with your local filing, that would affect 
um, all of your international filing. So, I mean, I'm sure Marcus is available to walk you through this process. So we don't expect that this would be an issue, but if it happens that JIPO denies your, um, your application locally, then that would affect all of your international applications. And then not all countries are members of the Madrid Protocol. So countries like Mexico and Brazil are huge territories that we're very interested in having more in having more market penetration in. Um, but you would have to apply individually to be able to access that, which um, if it's possible, we encourage. Okay, so um, we've been talking about trademarks for um, the Madrid Protocol because it's specific to trademark protection. Um, there are other kinds of protection for creative works, copyright being one which we'll discuss later, but um, it's exclusive right to the use of the registr registered trademark, um, and which confers you the ability to license to another party or merchandise or license for merchandising or um, you know, sell that trademark to someone else. Um, it means that when you have a trademark, it means that um, all the products and services that carry the mark um, are from one source. So that's what the, the mark signifies. Um, it signifies that there is a certain quality level. So once you have that trademark established, anything under the goods and services associated with that trademark are now um, assumed to have that level of quality, which is important for the protection because it means that, well, you know, if you see a certain trademark, it means that um, this, you, you expect a certain quality of product. Um, and that's what is conferred by the establishment of a trademark. Um, it serves as a prime, uh, as an advertising tool and a marketing vehicle. Um, and it permits the trademark owner to distinguish um, their products from other parties. Um, so I just want to give you an example of how trademark protection can, um, can it, how it has value. Um, so SpongeBob is, is trademarked. Um, and because SpongeBob is trademarked, there was a dispute in the US where a, um, a restaurant named itself the Krusty Krab. Um, the Krusty Krab, so, so naturally the SpongeBob disputed it, the Krusty Krab claimed that it had no connection to, to SpongeBob, but because the Krusty Krab is one of the elements underneath the brand, it therefore had protection and then they were able to, um, to get remunerated from, um, from um, enforcing that trademark. Um, so this is one of the ways that trademark can be useful to you. Um, it, you know, you can issue a cease and desist to have people stop using your trademark um, and you can also get remuneration for the value lost um, when someone else uses your trademark. Um, trademark law looks at confusing similarity, meaning if two trademarks suggest, may suggest um, the same list of goods and services or in this, in, for animators, the same show, for example. Um, in that case, there, if you can prove that there's a confusing similarity, um, then you may receive trademark protection. So on the right, we have um, Lucasfilm's trademark for the Jedi Order logo, which will now be Disney. Um, and on the left, a New York school that used a, um, a lightsaber, a lightsaber school that used this logo um, and they were able to dispute it um, because of the similarity. Below that, we have Disney and Dead Mouse, where Disney did dispute Dead Mouse's use of their logo, um, but they came to an amicable um, resolution. The reason is because trademarks are associated with those goods and services. So there are a number of elements um, associated with trademark. For, so for example, the sophistication of parties' customers, whether the parties' goods and services are marketed to the same consumers, whether there has been any evidence of actual confusion, etc. So in a case like this, it may have been found that um, 
these dead mouse fans didn't think the mouse head was associated with Disney and therefore there may not have been an infringement. So these are the kinds of technical specifications um, that you may find once you start getting into um, trademarking your, your, your products. Um, and it's important to consider as you develop your animated um, graphical characters as well. Um, so why is this important? Uh, it's important for one reason um, to protect your trademark characters um, and also for commercial exploitation. That can mean assignment and licensing. Once that trademark is established, you can now sell the trademark outright to another party, or you can license that trademark uh, for a, a limited period of time or a for some geographical restriction. Um, and the point is that once you own the trademark, it's up to you how you um, assign those rights and what kind of value those rights are worth. And then merchandising is basically licensing, but for different medium um, separate from the original medium. So let's say SpongeBob may have been licensed originally trademarked to the TV show, but in terms of merchandising, it might be a lunch kit now, it might be shoes, it might be, you know, a Happy Meal. Um, and all of that has value. So whichever I was talking about earlier in terms of this massive value in the animation industry, a lot of it comes from the secondary exploitation of, uh, of trademarked products. Um, and these are some of the ways that that can happen. Now, trademark protection isn't the only type of protection that your animated product can benefit from. Um, copyright protection is actually the foremost kind of, of protection for your animated products um, because copyright protection is a little broader in terms of the narrative protection of your, of your copyrighted um, graphical character. So you may protect for example, so the storyline, the script, um, these kinds of things aren't protected on a trademark um, because trademark has to do with the visual representation of the product, of the brand that represents the goods and services underneath that brand. Um, copyright protection also is conferred um, once that creative good is created. So once that script is created, you do have copyright protection, but in terms of proving it, um, you would need to, for example, there are ways to, to, to prove that copyright protection, like, um, you know, poor man's copyright, which is mailing the script to yourself, for example, and not opening the envelope. Um, and for this reason, copyright protection is actually cheaper than trademark protection. Um, and it's, it's also international in scope. Um, uh, it covers over 160 countries um, and that's through the international treaties that Jamaica has signed. So if you do have copyright protection in Jamaica that gives you copyright protection internationally, um, of course, in order to enforce that, you would have to go through the legal channels in that territory, but that copyright protection is available to you. Um, and then in terms of copyright protection, um, infringement is evaluated on the basis of substantial similarity uh, as, as opposed to the confusing similarity of trademark protection. Um, these legal distinctions are important. There are different types of protection afforded to you depending on the, the IP rights that you have assigned, you have been assigned, you have assigned to your present, um, but what's important to note is um, for creative products, you want a convergence of all types of IP rights. So that includes copyright, trademark, and unfair competition law. Um, and it is this cloaking of your, um, of your animated character in different types of IP law that helps you to maximize the value associated with that, um, with that character. Um, so it's important to understand that 
you will want to pursue all avenues for the protection of the value of your animated project because it is it is valuable um and international law is does have different perspectives on that value um which is important for you to understand as you're developing your graphical characters um, and your copyright products so why should I trademark my animation IP internationally? Um, well, graphical characters, animated characters um, are intangible in, in, in nature. So it, it's very easy for a cartoon character to move from the screen to the, from the movie screen to the internet to a lunch kit. Um, and because of that scope, you want to be able to protect your IP in all of those different areas. Um, and you do that by, again, pursuing all the different avenues of IP protection available to you. Um, one of the new ones now being through the Madrid Protocol. Um, it's also important because as we discussed, the licensing and merchandising value um, the legal support in the event of infringement. Um, and also because um, through the Madrid Protocol, um, that IP protection encourages innovation. Because you know that you can protect that value, it should encourage you to create more with that in mind, with the commercialization in mind. Um, as well, it encourages trade and foreign direct investment. Um, and it reduces the burden of cost for investment in protection rather than invention. You don't want after your character is created that you're spending more time protecting it than continuing to create. Um, and protecting the, that graphical character can be a cost far that far um, surpasses what it would cost to, um, to protect it in the first place. So all of these, all of these different elements of the value of your animated project are things that you need to take into consideration as early in the, in the process as possible uh, because the, it has real value and there are persons internationally that are out there looking to absorb that value away from you. So um, for example, there is um, trademark squatting. If you develop a product and it has a trademark, but you haven't, it has a logo and insignia, a graphical character, but you have not established a trademark for it, um, you may find that when you are looking to get into the US market, that somebody is owns that trademark and you don't have the legal support to challenge that. And they're requesting a fee for you to buy it back from them. You don't want to end up in that type of position. Um, so best case is to start thinking about it now about how to avoid that type of that type of scenario. And you also, again, you want to maximize the value from, from your characters. Um, this is the way to do it. So what now? Um, you are aware of what the, the value of trademarking your IP is, of what um, copywriting your IP is, of the Madrid Protocol as a mechanism to be able to take advantage of that. Um, what do you know with that information? First of all, you want to develop your animation stories and characters, etc., with IP protection in mind. That means, um, for example, we had spoken earlier about um, the, in, the methods by which um, your trademark could be infringed upon, such as confusing similarity. So you want to develop your insignia um, from conception in a way that is unique and varied and difficult to replicate. Um, that increases the value of your IP. Um, you want to protect your trademark and copyright locally. Protecting your trademark locally is a prerequisite for the Madrid Protocol. So that would be your first step. Um, and you want local protection. You want protection domestically in the first place because it's not just international. Um, it's not just in foreign, they're going to you know, sport on the trademark, for example, or to replicate your 
characters and then absorb that value, um, it happens here as well. So as early as possible in the process, you want to start that trademarking and copywriting um, to start those activities. Um, and then you want to determine the countries where you need to register your mark. You wouldn't necessarily register your mark in all 90 countries, um, but if you would um, search and find those countries where you are looking to, um, to sell your product or are likely to, um, to absorb that value from you, um, and then you start identifying them as territories where you want to register your, your trademark. Um, then of course, file your trademark application uh, with JIPO as soon as possible, um, particularly if you intend to do business abroad in the short term, and finally seek legal advice. Um, this, that's probably the most important thing here that as soon as you start co conceptualizing your content that you want to understand what is the scope of protection of that content um, so you can ensure that you maximize the value as much as you can so you can start getting a piece of that pie um, from the revenues being um, you know the revenues coming out of the animation industry internationally uh, i think that's the idea um, behind a lot of the creation here at least one of which is that we expect to be able to um, exploit it commercially. Um, and through the Madrid protocol, there is an avenue to do that um, with our trademark IP rights. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan. Um, comprehensive presentation. Um, um, great takeaways, I guess the biggest one being um, don't wait until you're done and don't wait until your work is out there before you look to protect it, do it before. All right, so we have uh, some questions that we're going to be taking. Um, we had um, some questions that came in early uh, from Mr. Jackson, Sir Kevin Jackson. Um, First question being, will the Madrid protocol, meaning signing up one form to apply for a registration of an IP in selecting in selected Madrid protocol signing countries? Um, uh, doctor, would you like to take that, doctor? Please, just please repeat. All right, the question is, Will the Madrid protocol mean signing up one form to apply for registration for, of an IP in selected Madrid protocol signing countries? So he's asking if you just mean if you just sign one form to apply for IP in all the countries. And I think the answer to that is no. Right, right. Um, so Tristan had the 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 list of countries there, and that's how the form looks. You have to choose which countries you want to have your trademark registered in, and then the fee will be calculated accordingly. Okay. Um, I think we recapped the second question, which is what does the Madrid protocol not do? Um, I'll go to the third question. Do I still have to engage? Okay. Oh, Mr. Mr. Jackson is clarifying those, the, the question was selected countries, not all countries, so. Yes, so yes, so the answer is yes, only for those that you select. Okay. Um, does he still do? Do I still have to engage? Or let me say, do does he still have to engage entries in other countries he's applying for IP protection? And if so, what's the procedure? So you don't have to engage other countries directly because going to the Madrid Protocol means that you can go through that route. You know, however, if it is that when you file in the in the several countries through WIPO, um, you get a refusal back, then you'd, you'd have to deal with that um, IP office directly in terms of that refusal. If you wanted to challenge it or to you know make some appeal or that kind of process thereafter, you'd have to deal with them directly. OK, um, going quickly as I can. Are all future IP registrations subject to the protocol? Or will that be determined by the creator whether they want to go that route? 
Right. Um, it's up to each applicant. So person can still, after we we sign on, come to Jaipur and just file in Jamaica alone, you know, to our, our normal Jamaican process. That's quite um, permissible. So it's up to the applicant to choose either national route or the country protocol. You can also okay. file um, internationally without using the Madrid protocol. So you can file for international territories um, without the protocol, if you prefer that. Okay, right. so I'm gonna, so that segues nicely into the next question, which is when should I avoid registration under this protocol? When should I avoid it? Well, I guess if you don't plan to really trade overseas, you know, if you're only trading locally, um, you know, then you probably would need to go international. You know what I mean? But if you're planning to go, okay, so if you're planning to go to maybe, yeah, if, if you're planning to go to one country, right, where that country's fees nationally are not as much as the as the Madrid protocol fees, that could also be another, you know, um, choice that you make. But if you're going to more than one foreign country, I would probably say it's best to check out the protocol. Okay. Um, what are the do's and don'ts when registering under this protocol? Do's and don'ts. Um, Big one. <laughs> well, I think the first, um, the first don't is don't, as you said earlier, Shavar, don't just go for what you think you want, which is the globe, right? You just spend a bag of money, or maybe it was um, Christian who said it, you know, and you don't have a plan how you're really going to make money from those countries, from those registrations, right? So it, it, it must form a part of your business plan that you're pursuing this registration in those countries because you plan to export there, you plan to trade or do business there, you have some presence there. If not, then you're probably going to just waste your money. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so moving on to the unanswered question so far. Um, I think this one is for you, Tristan. With the advocacy of FAM, do you advocate for hardware like graphic tablets? Oh no, that's, this is not a Madrid protocol. That is more of a advocacy question. Um, I, all right, uh, policy and advocacy. Okay, I'm just sliding down through the questions. Um, this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for those who have asked. Um, Jampro TV, I believe it is called. All right, how do I handle bundled rights under the Madrid protocol? Do I have to file for trademark for each character, the music, the logo, et cetera? Or is there a way to file for the show that covers all the elements within the show? I'm assuming he's speaking about maybe a, yeah, a show, television show. So he's asking, does he have to, if, it, if there's a television show, does he have to file for each character or animated project? Does he have to file a, pro, a trademark for each character? So SpongeBob and Patrick would be two different characters. Does he have to so, file for each, each right. along so, with the music, the logo, et cetera? Or is, it, is there a way to bundle the entire package, everything within that, 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 that um, project? Um, so as with the, um, and again, we would definitely encourage you to seek legal counsel for these questions. Um, but for example, with the SpongeBob um, case, the Krusty Krab wouldn't have been filed for, SpongeBob would have been filed for, and then there's a list of goods and services under SpongeBob, which you would define as representing a part of this brand. So if it's a part of this world, this TV show, this brand, then you wouldn't have to file separately. Um, but if it's separate from that, then you would. Um, so for example, the Disney Mickey Mouse brand, you, you file, they, they file for Mickey Mouse and there are a list of goods and services underneath Mickey Mouse. Um, and then, so that can represent that whole world um, because it's a brand, it's an insignia that represents a brand. Um, whereas copyright protection is more about the actual storylines, um, the intricacies of the um, creative project. Okay, um, another so question. The, the, the annoying it? answer is it depends. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one question says, I'm a Canadian entity wanting to international trademark. 
for several countries, including Jamaica, do I register via Jamaica or can I use a trademark company in Canada? Is this accepted and acknowledged, acknowledged under international? I think the answer to that would be yes. You'd have to, you can register in Canada. Yes, that be correct? yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, am I protected from fan art making money? So I think many times, you know, people do their own art, whether it be for a Star Trek or for any animation project. Um, it's a copy of your original work. So can, can I protect myself or can I make money from people doing fan art? That's the question. Christian? It depends. Um, it depends as per territory. So for example, in the US, even if you have a brand trademarked, there is fair use um, laws which state that if you take that character and use it in, for example, a meme, then you wouldn't um, be infringing on the rights of the character owner. Um, again, these intricacies, it, 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 it depends per territory. Um, so I'm not sure what the case is here, um, but I do know that it's different, it varies um, for each territory. So it may be that the fan art, it depends on how it is used and what product is it's associated with. And um, as I had said before, for um, confusing similarity for infringement for trademark, um, it would depend on if persons see that fan art and um, believe that it is a product of the under, under the original brand, or they understand that it's separate from the original brand. Um, and these kinds of distinctions will define whether it is an infringement or not. All right, thank you very much, uh, Tristan. All right, we're up on time, but I'm just gonna do a couple more questions um, and then we're gonna close up. Is there a public database to see all the protected content in Jamaica to avoid copying someone else's protected material? Right, so yes, the trademarks register um, held at Jaipo is both in hard copy and electronic. Um, so a person can come and search either register here to see what we have locally registered. In terms of overseas registrations, then persons would have to visit um, the website of each of the IP offices that, that they want to search. Some of them have online search engines that you can search the registers as well. Some of them, unfortunately, don't, you know. Um, but each maintains their own register. So you'd have to really do a search um, if you can to see what is there before you go and choose to register your trademark there. Okay, thank you. All right, just, uh, we're nearly finished. Um, I'm gonna take a question from Glenn Henry. To my understanding, the main issue of, to legitimate breaches of trademark corporate and going unchallenged are the associated legal fees, including travel. Is there an, an initiative to or fund that is accessible to local creative practitioners to allow them the means to properly defend their work? Defend it locally or overseas? Or overseas. Both. Right, okay. Um, so the short answer is really no. You know, there is no sort of legal fund that I'm aware of, you know, globally. I mean, there, um, there was a pro bono IP organization I was aware of um, you know, that used to do those kind of things, but they, they, they folded about two years ago, you know? Um, so, I mean, each country may have some sort of legal aid for IP or, you know, some kind of IP pro bono legal help. But again, you'd have to really make that check in each country. Um, what I think would be useful, and we have been trying, you know, various times to kind of network with, with Jamaican lawyers overseas, you know, some of whom I know have offered to help, you know what I mean? So that's also possible too. And so you could maybe make some contact through the high commissions, you know, wherever they are, um, or where you want to go to see if there's some sort of contact for a, a Jamaican there who would be willing to give you those kind of services for you know, pro bono or some discounted fee. Okay, thank you. Okay, so one more question before we go. Um, and I actually like this one. So what happens if I don't plan to trademark in America, but someone in America is operating under my trademark? 
would that mean that it would be too late to apply or, or, ha or have some legal recourse to have them cease and desist? I believe the answer to that is you don't have legal recourse except to try and buy it from them. That's, um, Dr. Goff, am I correct? Yes, I mean, it's really a first come first serve. So if you want to go to the USA and when you go over there, you see that there's somebody already using the same or very similar trademark, then you would have a difficulty to get yours registered. And you could try to challenge their registration, you know, if you think that there's somehow fraudulent or, you know, maybe, you know, it's misrepresenting, there's some reason why it should not have been registered. But generally speaking, you would have the burden to try to, to have their trademark invalidated. And if you can't, you, you have to choose something else. Okay, um, I know I said, I, I know is, I said one. I, I just wanted to add to that. This is why we encourage you to um, trademark early um, because trademark squatting is a thing and um, persons are looking for products that are gaining popularity in domestic territories that have not been tra trademarked internationally. So um, that is something to consider if you think that that value might be lost in a territory like the US. Um, I would say then, then, I would say then um, Tristan, that it's very important to consider carefully um, the markets that you want to defend. And uh, you need to do this before your work is out there. Because once it's out there, the sharks may get it before you get to defend it. Um, all right. All right, I know I said one more question, but I like there's one other very good question I want to just throw out there. Um, I hope you don't mind. I know we're all learning, so I know nobody minds, right? Following on an earlier question, if you have to research the international registers individually, with the Madrid protocol, the applicant would therefore need to research to search beforehand. Is this correct? It's advisable. It's advisable for sure. Because again, you know, you spend a lot of money to develop your brand. You know, you do your, your labeling, your packaging, maybe you have your, your, your ad campaign and your, your marketing materials, all of that you want to make sure that you're not going to go down a road that you will be blocked when you're trying to go to the USA. So again, I'm saying, Start with a clear business plan. If it is that you know that you have in your plan, even if it's not now, but in the future, you plan to expand to the USA, to the Caribbean, to the UK, etc. you know, then try and choose a trademark which you have done some research on to ensure it's not yet registered in those countries. I mean, sometimes we do see where people then, when you go overseas, they have to change their trademark, change their brand. Again, you know, it can be done, but it's probably going to mean more cost, you know, to market a brand new brand, etc. to get the, the whole consumer awareness, that kind of thing. So it's best if you do that search, not only here, but wherever you want to go to see what's available for you. So, Dr. Goff, uh, I, th so if that is the case, would, it, would the reverse apply? So if, let's say, and I don't even ask this question as well, if, let's say, Mickey Mouse or SpongeBob is not trademarked in Jamaica and somebody turns up and trademarks SpongeBob here. Yes. Um, is it the same? They would not have any legal recourse. They'd have to buy it from, 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 from us here. Um, all right, so there is a provision in the law which talks about well-known trademarks, right? Which don't have to be registered, but are still legally protected. So if it's well-known, you know, some of those trademarks like a Mickey Mouse or like a, like a Reebok or, you know, like a, Toyota, it's, it's one of those well-known brands. Um, the law protects them even though they, they are registered. So that would still be a stumbling block for you because the office would then have the right to refuse it on that basis. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna then question where does the line of well-known and um, where do you, how, when do you cross that line? Is it, is it only for the mega brands? No, it's really left to well-known in Jamaica, you know? So it could be, for example, a Jamaican brand like Island Grill, it could be, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a global brand. It can be a well-known like a Jaipur or a Jampro, you know what I mean? These are well-known brands in the local space as well. So it's more about the local consumers, but they would deem to be well-known, you know what I mean? And if the consumer would feel that a Mickey Mouse being owned by a Jamaican brand would be confusing because of the well-known um, brand of Disney, then we would probably refuse on that basis. So it's, but it's definitely based on the local knowledge of the consumer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goff. Thank you, Tristan. Um, I just want to add it. It's sure. also based on how good your lawyer is. So that, that's a factor as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um,
all of our panelists. Thank you very much for attending everyone. Um, we do appreciate you taking your time to learn about the Madrid Protocol and all the ins and outs. Uh, thank you for all of the questions and thank you for your participation. Um, as usual, we just want to just stress again to in the process of developing your project, um, start thinking about the business of your of protecting um, your work. Um, do not wait until you are finished. All right. Um, all right. Have a good evening. And um, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you too. Thanks, right. Shabar. Thanks, Mark.